basically some observations. Um, I guess to get started, uh, um, I did some, a friend of mine who's an archeologist and I, uh, we've uh, in the past been sort of enamored of the um, southeastern corner of Utah and the Canyonlands area. And we were sitting around with some beers probably one evening, it's been a while ago, where we decided that uh, why just take pictures when you can take scans? And at that time I had a an SX-10 and so we thought we'd um, get started and you know go out to this fairly remote area and uh the remote area was the first place we went was um uh the imperial valley south of the needles district in canyon lance park so it's not actually a part of the park it's uh, an area that's south of there um it's fairly difficult to access four wheel drive wise there's is was a road is a road in there but it's not used very often i think maybe some people with some atvs or uh dirt bike type things go down there and uh um uh we we decided to make an adventure there because a few years prior to that uh friend another friend of mine and i had sort of found this uh ruin that was on the top of a big rock, which you can kind of see in the center of the picture. I'm not sure if, uh, uh, you know, you can make it out, but it's the circular, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but it's that little circular structure on the, the top of this boulder. So um, I did a little survey where uh, the internet was not available to me, so I did a uh, a uh, uh, access project where I started up my um, uh, GPS unit as a base uh, with data logging and and then fired up a rover and uh, we set a, a, a occupy point and a backside point and then um, occupied that with an SX-10 and cranked out a couple of uh, closer to the ruin type type points and, uh, you know, set up there for some scans. Uh, we wanted to be able to reach the the ruin, but unfortunately, well, I was going to say a little bit here, kind of our little setup for, um, since, you know, we're sort of remote, I got a little camping area, no cellular service typically there, and uh, sort of had a, some some solar cells and a battery for, charging, uh, you know, um, equipment batteries and various things in the site. So we're out there in the, you know, so somewhat the middle of nowhere uh, in the comfort of uh, of our camp. And uh, um, we proceeded to take our camp and move it over to where the, this is the, the rock that you saw previously uh, with the ruin on top of it now. We wanted to get on top of the rock, but we didn't bring our ladder. Um, from the this top of the rock, uh, where the ruins located down on this side of the cliff is probably about an 80 foot drop. <clears throat> However, on the backside, backside of the of the rock, which uh, if I slip to my um, next uh, next thing uh, slide here, you can kind of see that uh, in this area, I believe you could you could put a ladder up and get up on top here. You can see the stone tower, got a doorway and some, well, they call them defensive walls, kind of meager, I guess if you're throwing sticks at each other and stuff like that, you could, and they were probably in better shape, uh, you know, a thousand years ago when this, this site was being occupied by our uh, Anasazi friends. I guess it's more politically astute now to call them uh, ancestral Puebloans, um, sort of an archaic term that came, I guess, that Anasazi came from 
uh, maybe Navajo, like something, some kind of enemy thing or something. I, I don't remember exactly, but uh, anyway, you can kind of see the the SX10 configuration that we put around the site. And uh, the previous slide was taken from this 0.500, which is in the near foreground. But uh, anyway, um, uh, here's a, an alternative perspective. Uh, you can still kind of see the the doorway and uh, the, the place where you could put a ladder. I kind of need a tall ladder. So actually, I've never been up on top of that. Um, haven't been back since we did this. Uh, this is like I say, in the time when we only had the SX-10. And uh, um, so, you know, we were sort of scanning it from afar and kind of wishing we could look inside, although uh, these these ruins are pretty sensitive. Uh, you don't want to be climbing around on them because it does so much damage. And, and uh, you know, you're, unless you have a specific reason uh, to to do this, then you're you're better off just staying out of them. You know, you could do some serious damage or, you know, one of those big rocks could fall on you, I guess is probably another good reason. Anyway, um, you know, I, in this picture, you can see a little better uh, view of the defensive kind of walls that were around there and the, and the top of the rock. Um, uh, uh, some of the stations for the surveyors uh, uh, in the, the visible in the in the picture as a you know came from TBC basically. Uh, here's an actual photograph taken from the SX10 that sort of showed a a, a similar thing. You kind of get a picture for the background of the Imperial Valley and Elk Ridge uh, in the far distance out and back. So uh, it, it's it's not an easy to access area. So. Um, here's another another viewpoint. Um, um, as we did this, we said, "Oh man, that was kind of fun, you know? Why why just take pictures when you can bring home 3D lidar scans that are you know three dimensional in nature and stuff?" So then we got this other idea where we contacted the Bureau of Land Management in their Monticello office that at the time. <clears throat> This was prior to the Bears years. We're administrating the uh, the whole region out of that office, and we asked them if they would be interested in in the data that we were collecting, and they could add it to their cultural resources inventory, which they are sort of one of the things that they do with the lands under their jurisdiction. Is is that they you know try to collect facts and information on various sites that they have you know in their in their arsenal there and out here in this southeastern area of utah the, there's quite a few um quite a few uh aboriginal type ruins and things like that so they seem to be receptive uh but the way that they kind of control it was is that they they issue permits to to do this kind of that way. They have a way of tracking the information that comes in. They usually file it probably under the permits that they've issued to to do this kind of thing. Plus, um, they also had access to sites that they uh, administer and maybe wanted more data on. So um, that's uh, how we sort of got into this thing. Um, so anyway, we we uh, did that, and here's one of the things that they provided us was their site form on uh, that uh, Imperial Valley ruin. This is from 1964. You can kind of see that the this is the first couple of pages of it. Then the next uh, page or two has some photographs and things like that, where they they sort of describe the site and take the relevant information and keep it in their file. So after we supply the uh, LIDAR scans, they also have some digital information that shows the same thing. Okay, so then we decided we would move on over to the, what was to become the Bears Ears National Monument. And here's a view from 
one of the sites that we were up on top of and in the distance there you can see the bear's ears and uh um, in the foreground there it's a it's a sort of a flat topped uh mesa called uh cedar mesa a little bit uh uh to kind of between natural bridges national monument and the uh town of blanding uh so um uh we we took their permit and one of the first uh projects that we did was uh, a sensitive kiva that uh, they had discovered and it was in uh, a little canyon and uh, uh they, they it was sensitive because of the fact that it didn't look like anybody been in there since the uh the anasazi had left so we were shown the way and went out there and did some scanning. Uh, this picture shows uh, it was a cave and here's a, one of the entrances to the cave and then there's a smaller entrance to the right of it there, a little a little black area and right on the edge of this, this canyon that uh, leads out off of uh, Cedar Mesa out into the flats of, um, of uh, Comb Ridge or the comb wash, which is adjacent to the, to the ridge there. So anyway, so uh, here's a quick photograph of something I snapped uh, in the uh, from the inside of the cave. And you can see the the Kiva walls, which are the stone walls around the outside. It's it's circular in in nature. And uh, this is the largest of the two entrances. and. You know, those are basically uh, footprints that you can see there are our footprints. It was just completely soft dust when we we had first gone in there. Um, <clears throat> so uh, here's a picture looking from the top down. Uh, the larger, you know, uh, sandstone rock This is into the bottom of the canyon. It's black down there because the scanner didn't pick up anything. And on the far wall of the canyon are the cliffs and then down around the the lower right hand corner you can see this little pod that sticks uh, into the 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 wall of the canyon on the side and that that's the uh the wall uh, inside of the cave of um the uh, great kiva it was called so here's a, a lidar scan of the of the face of the cliff uh, you know uh, not not a lot of detail but there was some the entrance here, and you can probably see some of the equipment boxes for our scanning thing to, to uh, do that. Here's a little better picture of some of the things. Of course, there's the shadows where the scanner didn't hit anything. And these are the three positions that we used uh, kind of outside. And then there was a scanner position on the inside of the of the cave as well. Um, let me jump to the next slide here. Here's a picture um, using the uh, C inside command and TVC, where you can see the circular nature of the uh, Kiva wall in there. I guess they hold ceremonies, and there was a uh, pile of stones in there. Looked like maybe it had, you know had some fires or something in there. And um, I'm sort of giving you a non-archaeologist perspective on this. I'm sure my uh, friend uh, Peter Gleichman, uh, the archaeologist, could wax way more philosophic on the on the archaeological details of this. But uh, um, here's the uh, uh, also the cave continued off of the screen to the left, um, but it behind the wall and things like that didn't make too much of an attempt to capture any of that. It didn't go very far, just kind of went back into the blackness and got so there was hands and knees type crawling. A uh, little better perspective, a little closer up where you're looking at it from a different angle and you can still see the stone, the, the stacked up stones. And maybe even at one time there was some, uh, some uh, um, plaster on the insides of the walls. I, I don't remember seeing any of that myself uh, in this particular thing, but uh, sort of a top down view. You kind of see our footprints in the soft dust um, uh, where we uh, uh, had, had 
um, tried to capture some of the detail. Uh, I don't know how that branch got in there, uh, like a kind of a stick, uh, uh, you know, part of a, a tree or something that uh, was, uh, you know, in in there. And I'm pretty sure they don't grow in that environment. So somebody had to have carried it in there at some point in time, maybe, you know, 800 or 1,000 years ago. Um, anyway, so uh, our next place we decided to go on one on our permit was uh, called the Dry Wash Towers. It's on the edge of Cedar Mesa. And this is the view from where the towers are. You can see a little bit of the wall of one of the towers. Uh, it's basically some towers with some walls in between them and you're looking off toward Comb Ridge and the valley uh, just on this side of it called uh, Comb Wash. Um, and this is probably looking in the general direction of Blanding. So very scenic location, uh, kind of on the edge of a fairly high little plateau. And uh, it's kind of a, this is sort of an example example of, of uh, Anasazi or uh, ancestral Puebloans that instead of building their um, structures in uh, as quip fellings, they they had stacked up rocks and used uh, plaster and stuff like that to create things on the tops of the mesa. Here's a, a picture um, kind of from that same area looking along the uh, the edge of Cedar Mesa where it drops off into the into the washes below and you, know, you can see some of the tower structures in, in you know in the uh, in the site. This site uh, has a fence around it that was constructed. I think uh, I recall that it was probably back in the, the 30s or the 50s or something because uh, you know it's at the end of a of a well, there's a road that goes out there near the end of it, and then it's a short walk in uh, to to see this. So it's a it's a pretty uh, interesting site uh, down at the bottom of the cliffs. There is a way to climb down through the cliffs. I uh, were originally told, uh, yeah, that you know a uh, you know eight year old kid could easily do it, and so, but as it came, we came to find out that the uh, 75 year old kids weren't, weren't quite as up to it, although it wasn't super difficult. Uh, just sort of depends on your your uh, innate abilities and sensitivity to risk. Anyway, so I thought I'd throw in a, a, a money shot with a or SX7 or X7 scanner. Um, this uh, was you know, super helpful in its portability and being able to hike it back into the site, man, lugging that SX Dan around is, you know, you definitely need the waist belt and the straps on the backpack to carry that thing in there. But uh, this one was fairly lightweight. And as you can see, the the tripod, while being pretty stable platform, is uh, also very light. And, uh, you know, it's in the process of doing some, some scanning. I think we typically used like the the seven minute version, which included the, the panoramic photographs. So uh, we were able to uh, create some of those panoramic photographs, uh, uh, you know, to uh, uh, further document the uh, site and supply that, this uh, point cloud information and the panoramas to the Bureau of Land Management for this site as well. Uh, another shot kind of showing a different perspective. And this one here, you can see the the walls that tended to connect uh, the uh, towers. Um, and the fact that they're uh, on, on the top, you can see the fence in the background too, by the way. Uh, but the, you know, this, the, the conditions when they're uh, exposed on the mesa tops are sort of subject to a lot more atmospheric weathering and and uh, wall collapse and tower collapse and plants growing on in them and helping to take them apart uh, using their their plant resources to do that. Um, you can kind of see the defensive wall here in the foreground with a, a couple of the towers in the in the background there. Here's a, a, a picture uh, 
of the overhead view. Um, you can see the fence surrounding it. This is the uh, the uh, X7 scans that have been registered together. I I used uh, Trimble Perspective to get the basic uh, registration while still in the field. Uh, it's definitely a helpful thing to help you see what what you missed and whether or not it looks like you've got enough data. Uh, you know, this is showing the the bulk of the vegetation, some some dead, some some living and growing right in the structures themselves. There are one, two, three, four, five, five towers, I guess it is here in the thing. And then the there's collapsed walls kind of in between them. Um, the point numbers, of course, are the uh, uh, scan occupations. They make little circles because it can't see underneath it. But uh, um, this is uh, showing the, the site with the vegetation. Here's the climb down to the lower level where there are some uh, recess, the cliffs, uh, cliff, cliff dwelling type things just below this site. And then, then along the uh, one of the ledges there. Um, uh, that you can access. Not very substantial, but there were some pictographs uh, in there that you could see. This is a, a version that uh, has the um, classified region, uh, the high vegetation turned off, so you can see the towers a little better. They're circular in nature, and as I said again, you know, connected with, I don't know if they're defensive walls or not, but I guess they could be. I mean, not sure if they were just in the you know, uh, decor decorative walls, or it seemed like more defensive to me, but no, I'm not an expert. Anyway, here's the the crack that you can climb down and get on this lower ledge. Uh, it, yeah, a little dicey, but not too bad. Um, more detail of the uh, kind of an oblique view showing the the stones as they're as they're stacked in there and. I'm sort of guessing that they had uh, um, cedar and and uh, kind of stuff using for a, a roof on them, but uh, uh, there wasn't very much remaining of that part of the stuff. Um, here's sort of a, a closer up view of uh, the towers that you can see uh, a little more detail with the, the stone work. Uh, it, it did a pretty good job of of stacking those stones there. So um, a little bit of the fence in there, uh, obviously to the the vegetation is turned off on this. One of the more helpful things if you're doing a study and, and uh, you want to, um, uh, you know, if you have it in a, in a, you're out there visiting the site as like a, a Bureau of Land Man at Ar or Management Archaeologist. Of course, you've got your pictures, but uh, that you take and you're walking around observing and doing your little measuring. But when you have a 3D LIDAR scan that you can classify into regions, you can sort of uh, use the uh, Trimble Business Center to remove the, the, the obstructions caused by uh, the vegetation and just be able to have a, a three-dimensional record that can be used for measurement purposes and all kinds of things that archaeologists do based on photographs and things like that. This was a provides a little better tool for um, you know those sorts of purposes, you know, measurement purposes and and uh, uh, being able to clear clear some of the vegetation out of the way so you can you know, get a little better understanding of what's going on with it. So uh, anyway, here's a here's the uh, view of the towers where I classified them into a ground region. Uh, vegetation was turned off and uh, I called uh, this, I think I had to create by hand this region, um, just surrounded it and uh, basically called it a region like structure or something like that where you know, you can, um, you know, pivot around three dimensionally and uh, obtain dimensions of the of the structures you're interested in, things like that. One of the things uh, on this this site too was that the Bureau of Land Management didn't have a uh, a uh, site plan for it, so um, 
at least a current site plan. So uh, I went ahead on and prepared a little site plan by uh, um, outlining the standing wall structure and where the rubble collapse was and and uh, stuff like that. Threw in some contour lines. I think these are probably like uh, um, half foot contours and uh, you know labeled uh, some wall segments and yeah, the tower numbers and things like that. So uh, the BLM likes this kind of stuff, supplied it as a PDF that they could print at any size they wanted. Uh, here's a, another picture of the uh, structures that were below these towers. We didn't take the scanner down there uh, at the time. Um, you can see some kind of interesting things, a few remains of a square type buildings and the uh, the room structure at the left, you can see the the flat slab leaning up against it, which was a sort of a door that they could put in place and seal it up a little bit better uh, um, for their their purposes. And also on the the flat slab of the the right hand rock that has the structure on top of it, you can see the remains of some uh, pictograph uh, uh, painted on type uh, symbolism that uh, they they seem to have around a lot of their sites. So we didn't scan these these sites, uh, possibly something we could go down there and do, but they're not very extensive, uh, although they were they were kind of interesting. We move on to uh, this uh, other site that we did um, once again with the uh, the uh, uh, X7, uh, I might mention that we did use uh, um, geo-referencing to kind of put a lot of these sites in place in their correct geographical positions and stuff like that on the on the map. But at uh, any rate, you can kind of see a couple of pictures where the scanning is in progress. This ruin was called Many Hands. Um, every ruin, I mean, if the archaeologists talk about it, they're just going to give you numbers, and the numbers have significance in that they show what state it was in and what county was in and, you know, what site number is. And I think on Cedar Mesa, there's, I think I've heard there's in excess of 25,000 sites on this thing. Just depends on how vigorous you are and how much walking you want to do, and you can find all kinds of stuff. Some of them in fairly good condition, and the ones that are infrequently visited in the more remote areas uh, um, probably have, you know, burials and unexcavated portions of them. Once again, I say we we tended to not go inside, so many of these ruins weren't um, scanned. Uh, on the interiors just just because of, uh, I mean, if there was a research project going on, um, they could probably make uh, a better effort to get inside of them, but we weren't, we weren't uh, going for that level of detail. So uh, some of the standing walls uh, that were there, this is sort of a, the larger ruin had a little hole in it that uh, um, I think, I don't know if somebody had knocked it in there or whatever. I didn't see any remain, you know, any of the rocks from a collapse. So it, it could have been, this is a fairly easy to get to site. So uh, it could have been looted by people from, you know, earlier in uh, our more recent times. Um, on to the next one here in this picture, a little bigger detail of the uh, the main uh, ruin set of ruins, rooms and stuff there. And you can see uh, some of the uh, reasons why it's called many hands, uh, that white um, stuff to the, uh, on the upper cliff band there, the above the main ruin is uh, um, silhouettes of where they put their hand up against the wall and then somehow sprayed pigment on leaving the their handprint kind of uh, in the in the thing. And there's a couple of areas uh, where this is uh, um, uh, part of the uh, re in the recesses of the cliff face. 
here's a uh, more frontal view of that kind of thing where they did it. This is one of a couple of places where they did it. And you can kind of see uh, um, some of the details that they had there. And uh, when we, you know, also took shots, um, so corded values on each of the handprints. So you can see in the, this slide, there's a, a couple of areas where where there's quite a few of these handprints. Not sure what the significance was, um, but uh, you know, one of these ruins were kind of interesting in that they used a platform of a ledge that was in there, the, the recesses and then built their, their um, dwelling structures on top of the platform. Uh, moving right along, uh, here's another see inside version of uh, many hands and uh, um, the leftmost structure here. You can kind of these points once again are where those same hand prints were. But this is, uh, I believe, a Kiva structure, a, a round room typically like that. Um, and then this is sort of looking through the cliff face. You can kind of see some of the wrinkles where the C inside uh, TBC function was uh, not not you know, allowing you the transparency, but uh, you can kind of see into the floors of some of the rooms and some of the stones that had fallen in there in, a, in an entryway. Here's a little different uh, close up of that uh, round Kiva structure. Here's the uh, main building where the probably was part of a doorway in this area that uh, either collapsed or was further enlarged. Um, and these are once again, uh, not in the uh, true color version, but in the region color and the region, the pinkish kind of region was the uh, structure region. The gray was the cliff, overhead cliff, overhanging cliff. And then the brown, of course, is the is the ground thing. So um, once again, yeah, using you know these regions, typically you're gonna create a surface for this. You would use the uh, the ground region to create fairly detailed surfaces of the uh, of the region of the of the um, the site there. So, hey, uh, okay. Chris. Sure, Chris. Uh, we're about ten minutes over that time. Um, Jeez, my, uh, seems it seems like it's only been going yeah. five minutes. It's All it's right. pretty well, it's yeah, pretty fascinating in. information for sure. I I really appreciate you sharing that. Is there anything you'd like to just say just to sum it up here? Uh, well, let me just throw one more slide and say, yeah, people been going here for a while. Here's one of the. The things that they showed us, which was 1892, kind of some historical graffiti. So, like I said, uh, um, these kinds of things are out there, and I think a fairly useful tool if I can get the BLM into uh, uh, drag them kicking and scratching into the 21st century, where they can, you know, get their own scanners and, you know, sort of uh, continue on from where we left off. So. I will uh, at this point bail. Thank you so much, Chris. I really appreciate it. There were some fascinating pictures. I took a couple uh, quick uh, pictures and we'll we'll try to share those on our social media. That was a, a those are one of those dream jobs that we all wish we could get to go and capture some of the those kind of data sets. So that's pretty fantastic. Is there any questions uh, for Chris before we move on? Go ahead. How long exactly from start to finish were you out there doing all of that? Or so like periodics? Well, you mean uh, we would typically, this was a several trips that we had done. We've done, you know, usually a trip in the spring and a trip in the fall. And uh, we don't spend all our time scanning and doing stuff like that. There's quite a bit of bear drinking and stuff like that that goes on <laughs> uh, in the in the thing, uh, you know, carrying on, doing hikes. Right before you go up that cliff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so uh, we're old, we're old geezers and stuff uh, in our 70s. So, um, you know, I mean, if I was in my 30s, this would be a class A place to 
go and have fun. <laughs> yeah. Awesome.